Thus day, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting their child. While they were there, the time came for her to be delivered, and she gave forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In that region, there were also shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for you see, I'm bringing you good tidings of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there were with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men he, he favors. And when the angels had gone, they had gone into heaven, and the shepherds said one to another, Let's see this thing which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told about them, about this child. And all who heard it were amazed that the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told them. This is the written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Merry Christmas. What joyful music, what a great night to be together to celebrate the birth of the Christ child. And what a great joy in my life as your pastor to preach and share the written and spoken word tonight about the story of God coming to live among us, coming in the birth of the Christ child. And so I want to invite you to join me now in a moment of prayer. Great and gracious God, we thank you for this glorious music, this beautiful sanctuary, for hearts that are filled with hope and light and expectations as we gather for worship and as we will go later into our very busy lives. We take this time, God, to pause before the manger, to think about what you have done and continue to do through Christ and in and through us. So God, as we are grateful to you for coming to live among us, to bear our sorrow, to walk this earth, to feel all that we have experienced, and to give us a hope in a future, we sing with the angels, joy to the world, glory to God in the highest. And now, God, I pray that the words you have given me and our time together would be a blessing in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Friends, what a wonderful life we have been given. Don't you agree this really is Merry Christmas? Let's just say it again. Merry Christmas. It just puts a smile on our face. And as we celebrate these gifts of Christmas, peace, hope, joy, and love, I want us to think about the particularity of these gifts. And I have a rather unusual sermon for the 3 o'clock and for this group because you're going to help me preach it. How is that for a Christmas Eve? So uh, children especially, if the grown-ups don't get involved, it's okay. They've forgotten how that is. But children, I need you to help me. Would you do that tonight? Boys and girls, will you help me with my sermon? Excellent. All three of you are going to do that. That is so exciting. <laughs> 
Well, it's coming. I'll let you know when it's time. But I want to talk about these gifts. I'd like to talk first about peace. Peace is God coming to us, overcoming sin and death, the light overcoming the darkness. Peace is not something that is contingent upon our mood or our particular situation. Peace comes to us inside of us through Christ. It comes because we know that whatever happens, whatever our situation, God is with us. God brings that promise and God keeps that promise. It is not contingent on the dynamics in our immediate world. Although we know that our world is torn by violence and injustice and war and evil, but God is coming to make it right. And there is coming a day, as God promises, when all of that will be over one day. In the meantime, we're here to receive that gift of peace. We're here so that inside of our spirit, we can be calm, we can realize that God has us. And also, God calls us to be peacemakers. Jesus comes to give us that example and then calls us to be peacemakers. I want us to realize, too, that we celebrate tonight the gift of hope. Hope is absolutely the antithesis of doubt and fear and despair. We are given hope because God comes to us with a promise that God will fulfill exactly what God says he will do. God is working it out. Friends, this is why the angels show up. In our story in Luke and in other places in Scripture, the angels show up and they say, do not be afraid. Say that with me. Do not be afraid. I need that in my life. You need that in your life because there's enough out there to make us afraid. Isn't that the truth? But God says, do not be afraid. So you know what? We're not going to be afraid. Is that a deal? We're not going to be afraid. We're going to have that Christmas gift of hope. I love that. When people break your heart, do not. When tragedy and illness and death come, do not be afraid. When hope feels far away, do not be afraid. God is with us. Jesus is here in the birth, in the life, in the teaching, in the death, in the resurrection, so that our temporary condition of sin and suffering and death, temporary condition, gets transformed to the permanent condition of life, of peace, hope, joy, love, and eternity. That is our destiny. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Friends, I think about the next gift of joy. I love Christmas. I love it. And even when we have difficulties and hardships and pain and suffering, and, and I'll tell you, our staff and many of our people in the church know this. We live in the paradox of that. We go through funerals during the season. We go through people in the hospital. We go through difficulty, people struggling in life, relationships that are not good. But we live in that, but we also live in the joy. And the joy is not contingent on that particular situation. Joy, the psalmist says, that sadness is in the night, tears are in the night, but joy comes in the, who knows this, joy comes in the, in the morning. That means there's hope. That means there's a next moment. There's going to be an opportunity, and Jesus knows that. So he comes to give us joy. And we can have that joy in amazing ways. I want us to remember that tonight. Children remind us of that joy. In our 3 o'clock service, I asked the children, they're so excited about their gifts. And I said, how many of you think you're going to get everything you ask for? Children, how many of you think you're going to get what you want? Yes, parents, you have a lot of pressure on you. <laughs> Hope it works out for you tomorrow. <laughs> but the truth is, our church has been so busy spreading joy because God is in us and working through us, this is what we do. This is who we are. We are about helping people transform their lives. Our church confidentially, lovingly, and compassionately ministers to people who are going through financial troubles. That's why this offering is so important to us as well. Because there are people that go through life and on the surface people think they have it all together, and one 
one missed paycheck or one job change or something in illness or death changes their world and they can't pay a bill. And our church says, we've got you. We're going to help you. And we do that confidentially and compassionately. And because people here are generous, I love that about you. We packed, I still think about this, 100,000 meals this summer to feed people. Somebody say, that is awesome. That is awesome. It is awesome. Hundreds, lots of zeros, people, hundreds of children were able to receive toys from their parents through the generosity of Adopt a Family and Teen Elf and people in our church leading the way for that moment. That is awesome. And because it's important for children and other people to know that people care about them. So joy is abundant. We have missions all over the world where people are just hungry for bread and clean water and a roof over their head. And, and we get in our cars in our, in our fabulous area and we say, oh my gosh, this traffic, we, we, we. Y'all know I did it. I'll just confess right now I do it. But we're trying to impact the world because God came to save the whole world. Not a few people, not a preferential group, but the whole world. So when we think about the joy, when we think about what happens, and by the way, in ministry and in life, you just got to go with the flow. Do you know what I mean? That's what you've got to do. One of the things that I love about this season, uh, besides recording all the Hallmark movies so that I can escape some of the other drama in the real world, it, my favorite movie is It's a Wonderful Life. Who has seen that movie? Do you love that movie? So... I had somebody at the 3 o'clock say, you told us everything, you ruined it. I'm like, that movie's been around a long time, and I'm sorry, if you snooze, you lose. That is how it goes. <laughs> hey, this is my sermon, okay? <laughs> so this is my illustration. So in The Wonderful Life, this is what I want to I tell you about. In that movie, we have a character named George Bailey. So everybody say, yay, George Bailey, help me. This is the part where we say, yay, George Bailey. And then we have the mean, greedy, evil Mr. Potter. Boo, everybody say, boo, Mr. Potter. Taking money from the poor, extorting. And then we have sweet Uncle Billy. Oh, Uncle Billy. Oh, Uncle Billy. Uncle Billy loses a lot of money and it puts the savings and loan in big trouble. And that becomes a really key point in this movie. George wants to go out and see the world. He has big dreams in life, but he ends up taking care of everybody except George. He loves his wife, Mary. I love that it's a Christmas story. She's named Mary. Good writing, people. Good writing. And, and then they have these precious children in this story. You just can't watch it and not feel good and want to go help somebody. That's just how it is. And so in this movie, a series of events happens, like life happens, and George loses his hope, and he loses his, his opportunity to feel like he's going to make it. So he gets very discouraged, and he's going to go jump off a bridge. He thinks he's better off not being there, and that people will be better off without him. And so George tries to do that, but then there's Clarence. Everybody say, yay, Clarence! Woo, Clarence the angel! If I was going to have a guardian angel, I'd like Clarence. Clarence is just kind of off the chain. I kind of like him. And, and so Clarence saves George by granting George's wish when George says, I wish I had never been born. Well, you shouldn't tell God stuff because you might meet an angel. Just ask Mary and Joseph and shepherds in the field. And this is what happens. He goes through this process and he goes back through his life and all the people that he helped, every life he saved, every decision he made, all of that goes away by his wish. Then he realizes what life he really had. It's called the wonderful life. And at the end, as he's praying, as he's begging God, as he says, God, please, I'm not a praying man, but show me the way. And as he goes through this journey, and the Clarence helps him, and the money all gets collected by the townspeople, right? And they pour it all over the table, and George realizes how important his life really is. So this is one of, one of the sentences from there. Clarence the angel says, Strange, isn't it, George? Each man's life touches so many other lives. When he isn't around, 
He leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? Friends, that can be said about you and me. God is working in each and every one of us to change a life, to make a difference, to impact somebody some way. That is our prayer, God show us the way. And so when we think about that, and and it ends very happily, and you can help me with this because we like this part. At the very end, the evil, mean Mr. Potter doesn't win. We like that. Yay, everybody say, yay, yay, Mr. Potter loses, woohoo. Except what we have to remember in this story is that God forgives him too. God forgives gives us and loves us, and that's, sometimes we don't like that, but that's the way God is, right? So at the very end, everybody who, that has been helped by George all these times, all these years, brings all the money and piles it all over the table in their house. And George stands at the tree with his daughter, and he's helping his daughter, and the bell rings, and help me, every time a bell rings, an angel gets his or her wings, right? So it has a happy ending. Friends, God comes to us because life is messy and hard and challenging, and yes, it's wonderful, but God comes to us to be one of us, and only God can save us. No situation, no money, no, no act of our own can do it, but only God can do it. And so God does it. And so every time we think about Christmas, while we're out having fun, while we're doing what we do, let's remember why he came to give us the greatest gift of all. God is unwrapping these gifts, planned for these gifts. This came home to me, and I want to share this with you. It's very personal. Um, I know I haven't even met some of y'all yet. I know... Um, that that I've just been here a short time and and I'm trying to learn everyone. But I want to tell you something, that as a pastor, we meet God in all kinds of places. We do. And I encountered God in a way in my life, in a particular way that really did change my life. Things I used to worry about, things that upset me, ended up just being put to the side because I realized what was important and what wasn't. Two years ago, our daughter Jennifer, Jennifer is a second-grade teacher, and she's married to our son-in-law, Justin. He's, he's a lawyer. And they have um, given us a great gift, our second grandchild. And her name is Madison Denise. Madison shares my middle name as, as her mother shared her grandmother's middle name. And two years ago, I wrote this reflection because I want to tell you what we were going through as a family during the season. And Madison was born at 26 weeks of age, weighing one pound, seven ounces. It was an emergency delivery. It was a terrifying time because my daughter and my granddaughter were in grave danger. And it was one of those times when we just held our breath. Y'all know what that's like, don't you, where you just don't know what the outcome's going to be? And so we were all there in the hospital at Emory Midtown in the NICU area, in the delivery area, with, with their pastor at their church and with our clergy friends and other family and friends gathered. There were probably 30 people in that room praying for Madison to survive and for Jennifer to survive. She was born on September 13th, weighing that pound seven ounces. And so she spent the first three months of her life in the NICU. She went through her first Halloween, her first Thanksgiving, her first Christmas in the NICU. We have pictures and signs, and for the first several days, she was not able to be touched except by the medical team. And then as she got a little bigger, her mother and daddy were allowed to kangaroo her. Have y'all ever heard of that, where you get to hold the the baby next to you? Some of you have heard about that. So as we were sitting there in December and I was thinking about Christmas and I was thinking about Christmas Eve and how we were praying for her to get home and she did on December 29th, two years ago, I was watching Jennifer hold her and I wrote these words. Sitting here in the NICU room watching my amazing daughter Jennifer holding Madison to her heart. She is peaceful, but when Madison cries, Jennifer says to her, it's okay, Madison, Mama's right here. We watched for months the monitors, the heartbeat, the breathing. We lived between each heartbeat on some days. I watched Jennifer being calm and confident as a new mom because I know that children need to feel the love and heartbeat of a parent. All of our children do. Friends, if you're a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or uncle or friend of a little child, oh, please, in the name of all that is good and right and holy, be patient with them. Just love them 
through this very brief season of their life because it is very short. Even when you feel short at the end of your rope, it is going to pass. Children need to feel the love and the heartbeat of a parent. Madison calms more quickly when Jennifer holds her. And I can't help but think about it theologically. Y'all know that's what I do for a living, right? Y'all got that part. Life is a gift, and love is nourishment. And as tiny as Madison is in her sheer vulnerability, she is our strength. We know that God holds us to God's heart the way Jennifer held Madison. It is the gift of the incarnation. God is with us. And as I sit here and think about how Mary must have felt holding baby Jesus next to her heart in a messy, noisy, smelly stable in a world that was just filled with all kinds of difficulty, not beautiful and glorious like we're in right now, but just holding on. I think of how incredible life really is. In the midst of joy and tears in the most fragile moments, I can just hear God speaking to us by coming through the Christ child, speaking to us and saying, when we are crying out, when we're fretting, God holds us next to his heart and says, it's okay, my child, I've got you, I'm right here. And that's what he's saying to us on this Christmas Eve. I've got you right next to my heart. It's why I came. It's why I walk your path, love you, and try to do everything I can to help you be at home and be whole. That's what Christmas is. These are the gifts that God unwraps for us. So my precious ones on this Christmas Eve, I want you to know on behalf of of the relentless pursuing love of Jesus Christ, that the gifts of peace, of hope, of joy, and of love are here, right here, right now, and God holds us close to God's heart. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Amen. Great and loving God, I thank you for this Christmas Eve. I thank you for letting us see you in the faces of people all around us, in the stories that exist in this sanctuary tonight, in the families, in the journey of faith that people share. May we tell those stories even as we are unwrapping material possessions. May we remember that what you came for is what we live for and who we're supposed to be. God, would you bless everyone here, every family, every future, every hope, every dream. In the name of the Christ child who is our love, amen.